your precious Holy Spirit, that you would inhabit this place with your glory, that you would enliven us by your Spirit's presence. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Would you reveal to us the power and glory of Jesus? We lay our lives before you. And even as a sacrifice, we lay this next two hours before you as we come to see you, to seek your face, to know you more. And we choose to fast from the troubles and the things of our daily lives. And we shift our focus to you this morning. Show us your glory. In Jesus' name. Instead of a sermon today, I wrote a short story. I pulled, of course, from the four Gospels, but also from five or six other resources. There's multiple quotes throughout, and I'm not going to cite those because it would interrupt the flow of the story. I pray that this story impacts your heart, that God's anointing and presence would speak to you and minister to your heart as it did to mine as I was writing it. So settle in as I read you a story. As Passover approached, many Jewish travelers made their way to the holy city of Jerusalem in obedience to the Torah. They were there to visit the temple and to remember and celebrate the passing over of the angel of death from the homes of their ancestors, the Israelites, when they were escaping from Egypt. Simon and his sons were making the journey from Cyrene in Africa. It was a long journey, so there was plenty of time to tell the stories of old and to fill his son's imaginations with images of the gleaming city of David. This was the first year that Rufus and Alexander were making the journey, so they set out with great anticipation of the adventures that they would find there. As they traveled, the road became more and more filled with others that were making their way to the holy city as well. This city normally housed 25,000, but on this Passover season, it swelled to 150,000 people. They knew they were getting close to the holy city when the roads and byways become so congested that it was difficult to move without bumping in to someone. Simon kept Rufus and Alexander close as they passed through the Zion Gate into the walled city. Simon had made arrangements to stay at a hostel and on this Friday morning, the day of the Passover feast, they made their way through the city streets to their destination. As they approached the center of the city, the swell of the foot traffic was at a standstill. It was louder than before, and everyone seemed to be straining to catch a glimpse of a procession that was winding its way up the street called Via Della Rosa. He gathered his sons to his side as he began to make out the words they were angrily shouting, crucify him. Crucify him. Roman soldiers were clearing the street to keep the procession moving. Simon could make out the top of three large wooden beams that were being carried and could occasionally be seen above the heads of the crowd. As several red clad Roman soldiers brushed by, barking orders and pushing people out of the way, a break in the crowd opened up in front of Simon and his sons. Simon caught a glimpse of a bloodied man carrying a wooden beam over his shoulder, 
just as he wobbled, lost his footing, and fell to the ground. The man was wheezing, gasping for air, as he lay on the stone street, unable to get back up. Blood ran down his face, and his back looked like ground meat, where his clothes hung in tatters. He had lost the strength to walk any longer. These soldiers knew their job well and had plenty of practice. They were brutal and heartless. They would eventually crucify their prisoners, but first they would humiliate and abuse them as a warning to anyone else who might be tempted to oppose Rome. Maximizing pain and suffering before death was the purpose of their extensive training. These soldiers had already flogged Jesus incessantly and pressed a crown of thorns into his forehead. They spit on him and mocked him, shouting, Hail, King of the Jews, while laughing in contempt. After the flogging, they paraded him through the streets, a large wooden cross laying heavily upon his bloodied back. They were making their way to a hill outside the walls of the city, but now they could see that they might have gone too far with this one. If they were going to make it to Golgotha, someone else would have to carry Jesus' cross the rest of the way. He just didn't have the strength to lift it again. The captain of the guard looked around for someone strong enough to carry this burden the rest of the way. He pointed at Simon and shouted, You there, carry his cross. Outside the city gates and up the hill they climbed until they reached Golgotha. The heat was intense and sweat beaded and ran down Simon's brow. Many people had followed to watch the scheduled crucifixions, but they were hot and tired, and the noise simmered down as they watched the soldiers lay Jesus back down on the cross that Simon had laid on the ground. Hammers were lifted, and the first ringing blows were heard as Jesus' wrists and feet were anchored to the wood. They nailed a mocking sign over his head, the King of the Jews. With his body nailed in place, eight soldiers lifted the cross over a post hole in the ground and dropped it with a jolt. Jesus, now suspended in the air, winced as the jarring movement tore through the flesh in his hands and feet. They repeated this process, save for the sign, with the two other criminals that were to be executed that day as well. Time seemed to stand still as the clock ticked and waves of agony and acute fatigue swept over Jesus' hanging body. He prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. His mother, Mary, had followed him through the streets, weeping all the way. Her heart was torn as she powerlessly watched her beloved son suffer. Now, as she gazed up at him, she remembered the blessing that Simeon the prophet had spoken when Jesus was young. When he was an infant, they had visited the temple And Simeon had spotted them in the crowd. He had taken Jesus into his arms and lifted him above his head. And he said, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many in Israel, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. She remembered how she felt 
when Simeon had leaned into her and said, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. She hadn't known what he meant until this moment, 30 years later. Sobbing, she bent to the ground as she watched him suffer. The sword of pain and sorrow did indeed deeply pierce her heart. John, Jesus' closest friend, knelt beside her and draped his arm around her, mingling his grief with hers. Through the eye-blinding torture, Jesus lifted his head to look at Mary and John, clutching each other on the ground. He said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And to John, he said, she is your mother now. Tears streamed down both their faces as they looked up to him, receiving this final act of love and care. Off and on, as the Roman soldiers grew bored, they would resume their humiliation of him. With sticks, they poked and prodded him like a bear in a cage. They bellowed, if you are the son of God, come down from there. Save yourself, O chosen one. One of the thieves being crucified with him joined with contemptuous words of his own. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself, save us. Something was different with the other thief. What did he see? He broke into sobs, pleading with Jesus. Forgive me. And please remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus turned his eyes to him and with tenderness spoke. Today you will be with me in paradise. As time passed, the weight of Jesus' body pulled down on his arms and shoulders, compacting his twisted torso. His diaphragm was compressed and he was being suffocated by the downward force of his own body. To catch even a tiny breath, he had to pull himself up by his wrists and push down with his feet to give a little room for breath in his lungs. The price of these breaths was excruciating bursts of lightning hot pain in his hands and his feet. Every breath that he took cost him his limited strength and delivered unbearable misery. It was a vicious cycle of searing pain and suffocation. At noon, three hours into his crucifixion, an otherworldly darkness descended upon the earth as if the sun had been plucked from its rightful place in the sky. This black veil lingered for the next three hours, filling the watching crowd with eerie apprehension and foreboding. The crowd's jeering had lost its pleasure and they were anxiously awaiting death while trying to make sense of the ghostly heaviness that cloaked everything like a black blanket. An agonized outburst. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His closest, most intimate companion suddenly absent as the sins of the world were placed upon his shoulders. The ultimate horror, abandonment by the Father. The Creator had withdrawn His presence, and all was darkness. 
a lone tear dripped down Jesus' face as he whispered, I thirst. Someone lifted a sponge of wine to his lips and he drew in what he could. Struggling for another breath, excruciating pain evident on his face, he breathed out, it is finished. As a convulsion seized his body, he moaned in agony and gasped again, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. His chin dropped to his chest and he was gone. At three in the afternoon, as Jesus breathed his last breath, an earthquake shook Jerusalem. The eerie darkness that had materialized at noon had not lifted. This quaking, convulsive darkness was heaven's groan over what had just taken place on the Mount of the Skull. At the same time in the city, the slaughter of the Passover lambs that would be eaten that evening was underway. Thousands of people were lined up in the outer court of the temple awaiting their turn for slaughter. The priests were covered in the blood of the continuous line of innocent animals that they sacrificed to mirror the time when the Jews marked their doorpost with the blood of the land to save themselves from the spirit of death in Egypt. The earthquake violently shook the whole temple from the outer court to the most holy place. There were cries and screams as people tried to keep their footing. Inside the temple, there was a thick, heavy, gold-fringed curtain that hung between the Holy of Holies and the most holy place where the presence of God dwelled. The room behind the curtain could only be visited once a year, and then only by the chief of of priests after perfectly performed cleansing rituals laid out by the law. The curtain hung like the seraph with a flaming sword at the entrance of Eden, preventing anything unclean from entering the presence of God. While the great stones were shaking, the priests ducked in fear as they heard the loud sound of heavy cloth ripping. Looking up, they watched as the curtain tore from top to bottom as if an unseen hand were tearing a flimsy piece of scroll paper. Terror struck their hearts They had always feared what would come of a man who dared enter the holy place unprepared. They had heard stories of robe bells ceasing to ring and bodies being dragged out under the curtain by their feet. What was happening? Fear gripped those outside the city as well. As the earth violently shuddered, those gathered at Golgotha instinctively looked at Jesus' body, marveling that this great shaking had occurred at the exact moment that he breathed his last breath. Could it be coincidence? Or was he the source of this earth-shattering power? one of the Roman soldiers clutched his chest. He had been there all day and had seen the darkness that had spread across the land. He had heard the way that Jesus cried out to God in his final breath. He had felt the earthquake at that exact moment. It was too much for him. Why had he not seen it before? 
how could he have been so blind? Back inside the city, the tremors had stopped. And the chief priest pushed aside the issue of the curtain to give attention to the immediate problem that lay before them. They didn't want three convicted criminals left hanging outside the city during their Passover meal. The Romans could hasten the dying process by breaking their legs, so he gave the command to do so. The soldiers broke the legs of the two thieves first, but when they came to Jesus, it appeared that he was already dead. One of the guards plunged the tip of his spear into Jesus' side. Blood and water ran freely from the wound. No pulsating, a steady flow. Yes, he was dead. They took his lifeless body down from the cross and it rested on the ground. As the crowd dispersed, two men, Joseph and Nicodemus, picked up Jesus' body and carried it back into the city to a tomb in a familiar garden. They wrapped him in burial clothes of linen and spices and lay him on a stone surface in the tomb. Mary Magdalene and James' mother had followed them and now watched, grieving as the men worked. As they finished, the gardener sealed the tomb with a heavy stone. And with heavy hearts, the men and women made their way home just in time for Sabbath. Meanwhile, the chief priests and Pharisees went to Pilate. This imposter, this con man, kept saying that after three days he would come back from the dead. What if his disciples steal his body and claim that he's risen? His followers won't disband. They'll continue to oppose Rome. Pontius Pilate commanded to ensure that no one stages this hoax. Put a guard of my soldiers and secure the tomb. They dispatched to the garden and sealed the stone that the gardener had rolled over the mouth of the grave, and the guard stood watch through the night. If anyone wanted to tamper with this tomb, they would have to get through the soldiers and the seal. Early Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene awoke. She had first met Jesus a couple of years earlier when he had set her free from seven demons. When Jesus healed her, something came awake in her heart, a whisper to her soul that there might be hope amid the wreckage of this world. Mary Magdalene and the mother of James had witnessed Jesus' crucifixion with their own eyes they saw Joseph and Nicodemus claim Jesus' body and they followed them to the garden tomb on Friday evening to help with Jesus' burial. They were the last to leave his side on the Friday of his death and their hearts were broken. So this Sunday morning under the gray pink sky before the sun had fully risen, the two women gathered their oils and perfumes and made their way back to Jesus' tomb to give voice to their sorrow. As they drew near to the quiet garden, the earth began to once again shake violently beneath their feet. This was the second earthquake in the past three days. The first had come that moment that Jesus had died on the cross. That Friday when he let out a loud cry and gave up his spirit, the earth shook as rocks split apart and the curtain in the, in the temple tore from top to bottom. Now on their way to his grave, it happened again. It was unsettling. Only 
already unnerved. When the women reached the tomb, they were stopped in their tracks at the scene before them. They were taken aback by the image of a massive angel who sat atop the stone at the tomb entrance, dressed in dazzling garments. The ground around the tomb was littered with unconscious soldiers, these valiant, seasoned, hardened fighters who had fainted at the sight of the angel when it appeared. The massive stone at the entrance had been rolled to the side and the tomb was open. Their hearts beat rapidly as a wave of fear-stoked adrenaline washed over them. A booming voice caused them to shudder. Do not be afraid, he said. You seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he told you. In this moment, the two women remembered things that they had previously not understood. They remembered his words spoken so clearly. I must go up to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the chief priests and scribes. I will be handed over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified. And on the third day, I will rise again. Could it be true? They couldn't comprehend what they were seeing and hearing. It was too much for their senses. The earthquake, the open tomb, the unconscious soldiers, the man dressed in lightning the booming voice that only heightened their confusion and fear. The women ran from the tomb to find Peter, John, and the others and to tell them what they had seen. He was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. Hades glowed with penetrating light as the Son of Man burst through the gates. Wrestling the key from the hounds of hell, rescuing souls long bound in this otherworldly region of the dead. Warring angels accompanied him and held back demonic dogs as prisoners were led out with Christ the victor showing them the way. Where, O death, are your plagues? Where, O Sheol, is your sting? What appeared as a day of silence and rest on the earth was a day of battle and victory in the netherworld. At that moment when the earth had shook violently a second time, the bands of death were loosed. Graves were opened and bodies of those saints who had fallen asleep were raised to life and walked in the blessed city of Jerusalem again. What wonder and awe must have fallen upon their friends and loved ones as many saw them and welcomed them back from the dead. As Mary found Peter and John. She was breathless and the only thing on her mind was the body of Jesus. He's gone. They've taken him from the tomb. Confusion. What? How? With questions unanswered, Peter and John ran toward the tomb. They arrived to find the grave open as she had said. They peered in and saw the linen grave clothes lying on the stone slab where the body of Jesus had laid. They had to tell the other disciples. As they left the grave, they passed Mary Magdalene, who had followed them back to the garden. She stood outside the open tomb, still wrought with grief. I don't know where they took him. She stooped down to look inside again and now two angels sat on the slab where the body of Jesus had been one at the foot the other at the head why are 
are you crying? They asked. Wrought with grief, Mary said, I don't know who took him or where he is. As she spoke, she sensed something behind her. She turned to see a silhouetted figure standing in the morning sun, the sun at his back, stepping out of the shadow. The man said, Mary. Raboni, she gasped as she ran the few steps to fall at the feet of the man her spirit now recognized, her deliverer, her hope, her savior, her Lord, risen from the dead. Jesus' resurrection is the single greatest event in the history of the world. It opened the grave door of this fallen, broken world to give eternal life and salvation to all who will believe. Jesus met, fought, and beat the king of death death is defeated once and for all time. He is risen. His resurrection is the seal and memorial stone of the great work of redemption which he came to do. It's the crowning proof that he has paid all debt on our behalf. He has won the battle to deliver us from hell and he is our guarantee of life eternal and forevermore. Had he never come forth from the prison of the grave, how could we have ever been sure that our ransom had been fully paid? Had he never risen from his conflict with the last enemy, how could we have felt confident that he has overcome the power of death? But thanks be to God, we are not left in doubt. He is risen. The greatest gift of Easter is hope. Hope that gives us confidence in God, in his ultimate triumph, in his goodness and love, which nothing can shake. The devil, darkness, and death may swagger and boast. The pains of life will sting for a little while longer. But don't worry, the forces of evil are breathing their last. He is risen. One day this world will become like a long forgotten story. A new Jerusalem will rise. All creation will know that this is the city of the King of glory because they will hear a voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men and he will dwell with them and be with them as their God forever. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. We will live unbounded, walking eternally, seeing more and more of the glory of God. We will never come to the end of the adventure, for it is infinite. He is risen. Hear the dying cry of Jesus from the cross. It is finished. Hear the risen Christ proclaim, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The kingdom of God is a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And in the center of that kingdom stands a throne and on that throne sits a king. 
Behold the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. Behold the man of sorrows upon whom the Lord has laid the iniquity of us all. Behold the King of glory who declares from his eternal throne, I am making all things new. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We glorify you, Jesus. We thank you for your power and your might and your glory, your sacrifice. Awaken our hearts, Lord, to the truth. Would you seal it upon our hearts that we would not fear death, that we would not fear pain, that we would not fear sorrow because our eyes are fixed on you, the author and finisher of our faith. And we know that one day we will stand in glory face to face with you and with all of those who have gone before. We bless you and praise your name. Amen.